Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Ancient tools and burials, plants and seeds, Neanderthals. All these things we make no. Welcome to the Archaeological Fantasies Podcast, Episode 57. I'm your host, Sarah, with my co host today, Ken Fader. Today we're talking to Joe Wilson about the Burroughs Cave. Where is the Burroughs Cave? What was found inside of it? And what are the implications of the artifacts that we've been presented with so far? Get ready to think critically. Everyone, and welcome to the Archaeological Fantasies Podcast. I am your host, Sarah, and I am joined today by my co-host, Ken Fader. How's it going? It's going great, Sarah. How are you? We're three weeks into the semester, and so by my reckoning, that's where we're one-fifth of the way done so but who's counting you know but everything's going well my classes are going real well uh, i'm really looking forward to having this conversation okay great and today we are joined by special guest joe wilson who is going to talk to us about a topic near and dear to ken and our's hearts on top of constantly asking where is the garbage we like to explain how incredibly difficult it is to fake an archaeological site but Joe, you have actually encountered this phenomena, have you not? Uh, indeed, I have, and it's great to be here. Thank you for having us. Yes. Oh, thank awesome. you for being here. Thank- great to have you, Joe. I've got actually, you know, we have talked about fake archaeological stuff, fake artifacts. Um, next month, we're going to have Nick Bellantoni on, who's going to talk about a site in southeastern Connecticut that where a fake site was produced, and it was sort of targeting him. We've talked to um, Brad Lepper and Jeff Gill about the newer Coley Stones. We've talked about um, he- the Heaven of Rune Stone in Oklahoma and Crack Cave in Colorado. But in, in most of the cases we've talked about, Joe, these have been not, well, in some cases, one-offs. The Bat Creek Stone is one ar- one artifact. The Davenport Port Tablets in Iowa are like three or four. Heaven of Rune Stone, that's one. Uh, New Ecole Stones, two with inscriptions, and then a couple of others. The Grave Creek Stone, that's one. So we're used to talking about instances in which Somebody put a little bit of work into an archaeological fraud. Maybe they produced one or two or a half a dozen at most, planted them. Somebody dug them up. Oh, my gosh. We have to change the history books. Everything's different now because of this one or two or three, four or five or six artifacts. Burroughs Cave is not like that. Am I correct? No. Um, the, uh, The published estimates... From the very the, the 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 sort of wild and woolly literature surrounding it, are anywhere from I think three to eight thousand artifacts. Good lord! Like that. Um, the <laughs> actual ones that have been photographed and documented uh, are considerably fewer than that. But and you know because a lot of the artifacts may never have been published, but have been sold ah. to collectors, uh-huh. right? So right. it's it's an industry in in the manufacture of the artifacts. So but, whatever uh, the number, the whoever is doing this, very, very ambitious, a good hard worker, right? Prolific, prolific. Um, and so you you say it, the question is: Is there one manufacturer or more than one? It, it it's likely that it's relatively few. I'm not going to say that it's only one person doing it, but the this for, on stylistic grounds, you can say that there's relatively few artists because you see a lot of the same images over and over and over again, which tend to be square jawed, you know, lantern jawed, very <laughs> Caucasian looking, masculine profiles in low relief on mudstone. Or other form you know, other stones as well, not all the same rock, but mostly uh like mudstone uh, ovals, large mudstone ovals that have been used as kind of like a uh, uh, a canvas for mm-hmm. a portrait of some ancient person wearing a funny hat. <laughs> so the, it's important to have the funny hat. That's yes, how you know it's authentic. Yes. Well, let, yeah. Let's let's step back just a little bit. What is Burroughs Cave? Where is it? Yeah, g- okay. can you give it, us the history of it? It 
Where it is depends on who you ask. Oh, that's, that, that's the, not helpful. There, there are there are different there are different school uh, schools of interpretation. There have there have been many schisms among the heretics. We'll so wait, so wait, so wait, 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 wait. So this place we don't know where Bro's Cave is. The the title of my article is "The Cave Who Never Was," and that is because it has never been photographed documented in any first-hand way or seen by anyone other than Russell Burroughs. Oh, wow. That's not a, that's not a problem, is uh, it, Sarah? No, 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 hold on. No, but I'm a little surprised. He claims that, oh, a few, a half a dozen or more other people have seen it that were involved, indeed, his associates in, in uh, the promulgation of the artifacts. But whenever he claims somebody has seen it, it is after they have died. <laughs> so, so you're telling me Burroughs are... Cave is heaven? No, no. I mean, not they haven't seen it after they've died. It's after they die that the allegation surfaces that they were among those people who were taken on a tour of it before he dynamited it in the late 80s. So <laughs> wow. It was, it's a wonderful it story, was, isn't it? It was basically from about 82 through 89 that the cave was open and ha- and he removed all the artifacts during that window of time. He has released them to the public over the decades following. Gotcha. And and yeah, and nobody has ever actually seen. There have been a lot of tours to the to the sites in Illinois. Oh, but, so location, it's somewhere allegedly in southern Illinois. Which county, whether it's in Richland County or Marion County, depends on which of the two main factions of Burroughs Cave proponents you you listen to. Okay. Uh, it's basically on a tributary of the Wabash called the Embarrass. <laughs> it's, like, it's the tombs of the Embarrass. It's supposed oh to be uh goodness. it's supposed to be a a Ptolemaic necropolis. Uh basically the the place where the exiled Greco-Egyptian kings uh took their family mummies going back to Alexander the Great. They put them on a bunch of uh deep-hulled warships and uh, sailed across the ocean up the Mississippi River and up the Ohio, up the Wabash, up the Embarrass, and there you are. I don't, I don't think That's, you can, I don't think you can do that. Well, yeah, there, there, so my work has dealt with a little bit with the ship design in, t- in the tablets and the way that the ships are kind of copied out of books, right? <laughs> so, so the standard sources on Phoenician boats that have been used as food for thought among by the artists. Gotcha. And these boats, which were from basically early in the first millennium before the Common Era, they were used as pal- as palace reliefs in some of the ancient Assyrian and Iraqi palaces. So basically, Mesopotamian Assyrian art, you know, uh, traditions that go way back. Uh, palace walls. Some of their very early, earliest examples of scientific archaeology in the world were done in like Mosul and parts of Iraq and Syria that have then been blown up by ISIS recently. But you look at old books that were, that illustrate these relief panels from these palaces from like 7-800 BCE, and they show a lot of Phoenician ship designs. And you see these Phoenician ship designs appearing on Burroughs Cave Towns, allegedly as the 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 vessels that the colonists used to move from uh, the the late Roman Empire to Illinois. Um, gotcha. The when the when it happened is there's also debate. There's basically everything is disputed. Who, what, when, where, how, why? All of these questions are up for debate, and the proponents have argued many different things. The original arguments were made for a specific audience. They were the people who who, who came up with these tablets were uh, attempting to get acolytes of Barry Fell to believe in their authenticity. So they were shown around to the Epigraphic Society, to the the, the major figures in the Epigraphic Society in the early '80s, including Barry Fell himself. Barry Fell said bogus. He, at to his credit, I mean, I know that. This is this show is not a, a friend to Belt Barry Fell and the Epigraphic Society, but to his credit, he called it a hoax when as soon as he saw it. 
-hmm. and he alienated the people who were supporting Bur the authenticity of Bur Burroughs Cave. And so a number of Burroughs' friends and supporters broke off and formed their own splinter sect of the Epigraphic Society devoted to the promulgation of the Burroughs, the, the, the find of the century, Burroughs Cave. Many, 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 many little carvings. Now that we, we have a, a group of people who have clearly fallen for it, do we know that Burroughs Cave itself, or quote-unquote Burroughs Cave, do we know now for a fact that, that it was a fraud and that they were purposefully trying to fraud these people? If you go to the late Richard Flavin's website, Falling into Burroughs Cave, you can read the whole sordid history. We'll, um, we'll provide a link in the show yeah. notes for that. And, um, and that will answer some of those questions. He, he sort of sees uh, what, the way he presented it is kind of the allegory of the cave in Plato. How do you disprove a shadow? Okay. The problem is, the problem is, is that they have recourse to innumerable alternative explanations whenever any single ex explanation is challenged. Oh, so it's not this, it must be that. And so it's sort of like something where you try and disprove a specific claim and someone makes a counterclaim that is a workaround. Right. So or they move. The they move the goalposts. Yes, they constantly move the goalposts with Burroughs Cave. So whatever somebody disproves, there is a new, slightly modified alternative version of the story that accounts for the data in a different, in a different, and for puts it in a different light. And but the classic however, example is the is the cave site. So after my publication in 2012, where I basically said, look, there are no caves in that part of Southern Illinois. There's no karst topography. So mm -hmm. the notion that it's a natural cavern there is, is ludicrous because of the U.S. Geological Survey. <laughs> right. Um, the new fashion now is to say, well, it was never there. That was a deception by Burroughs. Burroughs was trying to throw people off the location of the actual cave by right. creating a kind of a false cave site. And that it's actually uh, several counties away in Marion County, which I believe is similar geologically, but it's still, you know, quite obviously moving the goalposts, as you would say. Right. Uh, in a but very, it, in a very and it flagrant manner. It, but, if, if Burroughs was, if his intent was to throw people off the scent, it's kind of foolish to put the cave in an area where anybody with any geological knowledge would immediately say, but there are no caves there. That doesn't seem like a particularly smart way of throwing people off the scent. Yeah, I don't, no, I, I, he wasn't trying to throw people off the scent. So he, he, he allegedly... I mean, because he never cha he never changed his story. All the right, people okay. who change the story are a different group of proponents, right? You understand that there is I there is a yeah, major yeah. discord among the belief the true believers. Uh, there's a lot of acrimony if you read the the articles that they publish in their own um, their own uh, uh, periodicals. I use the term loosely, loosely, I guess, that they have some of the, um, there are some extremely acrimonious and bitter exchanges between people who are favoring one, one view, you know, the Marion County view versus the Richland County. <laughs> or, or and, and you can see there are, there are ways that the, the chronology has been revised. So uh, the, the, the most important way was back in the early 80s, when they were trying to get the main, more mainstream epigraphy crowd, on board with their discoveries, they were essentially presenting this material as come as Phoenicians and Carthaginians and others from the first millennium before Christ mm -hmm. coming over to engage in the metal trade, basically going after Michigan copper. <laughs> you know, the, 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 right. the native Michigan copper way up in the Upper Peninsula. And, we, and we've right. talked about the Michigan copper thing on the well, show yeah, before. So they, they, this, that was their original hook, was trying to get take the Burroughs Cave materials and say that these were copper traders going uh, through, uh, fueling the Bronze Age, right? right. Fueling the, the old world bronze production using new world copper sources. I now, feel badly, I feel badly for them because when they got here, they were out of luck because the Minoans had already taken right. all the copper back <laughs> yeah. with them. Depending all, who, all of the copper. But, oh, but, yes. what, but then th that kind of bit the big one when the mainstream, when the more respectable epigraphy crowd, and I don't mean respectable in the sense of having academic street cred, but the ones who, you know, at least uh, had a little bit of self-respect about what they were doing, they refused <laughs> to leave it. Barry Frell rejected it. He said, these right. are crude copies of my publications that have been made into, that have been made into uh, uh, fakes that someone is trying uh -huh. to copy. 
do and we're wow. not have part of this. So what happened then was in the 90s, Russ Burroughs found a different audience, and that was hyper hyper diffusionist Mormon splinter groups. Oh. So Mormon fundamentalists. Now, again, I don't want to denigrate mainstream Mormons here because the mainstream Mormons, the sort of, you know, more more academically uh, respectable Mormon right. scholars reject it out of hand and they see it as ridiculous, too. So not talking about them, but I'm talking about like fundamentalist Mormons, Mormons who are on the fringe of Mormon <laughs> antiquarian scholarship and who are very interested in pre-Columbian transoceanic contacts that relate to the Bible peoples. Sure, sure. Right? So Jews and Christians. And that's when Burroughs unleashed in the 90s, so five or ten years after he began, began, he unleashed, or maybe more like 15 years later, he starts to unleash the Jesus Stones. In the Jesus great Stones. Numbers. Are they really so called the Jesus Stones? The Jesus Stones would be the kind of the par- the insider's parlance for these this particular subset of the Burroughs Cave horde. You have basically every old world race you can imagine, every old world language you can imagine in, in rather crude, semi-literate forms in general, not things that specialists would recognize as being, you know, authentic mm-hmm. examples of these epigraphy. But, but basically, it, it, imagine somebody going to the library, to the archaeology archeolo- section of the library, checking out a bunch of books and copying pieces of standard texts or using them as sources right. for materials for, for hieroglyphics or for various things. And so, you know, that is kind of so they're, they're, it's all over the place. But in terms of what began to be sold and, and published beginning in the mid to late 90s, it included a lot of more overtly Judeo-Christian um, subject matter. And that Judeo-Christian subject matter is what kind of gave Burroughs Cave its second wind. It probably would have died on the vine <laughs> in the 80s if the only audience for it were was, was skeptical middle-aged epigraphy buffs who were interested in Barry Fell's theories. Right. And who, I don't mean that they were skeptical in general. I mean that they were skeptical about Burroughs, right? Mm-hmm. I mean that their skepticism was was they, that that Burroughs cultivated skepticism among more uh, educated and and, um, and among those epigraphy buffs who were inclined towards the rational, we'll say, right, right. right? And it was the ones who were more devoted for ideological reasons to the notion that um, that. Bible peoples were here before Columbus spreading Bible messages to Native Americans. It was those folks who became the sort of the mo- the money makers for the Burroughs for sure. the production of Burroughs Cave materials. And it yeah. was through the the Ancient American magazine, which was uh, oh, we are right friends there. These particular, you can see the theme of Burroughs Cave material in Ancient America is it tends to emphasize the Jesus stones. Right. Well, Wei May, who is the editor of Ancient America, mm-hmm. is a Mormon. And, and a lot of the stuff in that magazine, maybe not overtly, but certainly um, on, on, a, on, a, on a lower level, att- attempts to, to, uh, to aim, it aims at the, a, a Mormon crowd, not necessarily in mainstream Mormons, but Mormons who right. are convinced that there there is lots of archaeological evidence that supports the story in the Book of Mormon. Um, what's interesting to me is that the Michigan Relics, which is another enormous uh, assemblage of fake archaeological artifacts found, for the most part, up in, in Michigan, so the northern plains, that those as well had, for a long time, and I think still have, uh, supporters of, within a, a particular um, section or, or subset of the Mormon Church, because again, there's this this belief that there is direct ev- that these represent direct evidence supporting the the historicity or the virtual truth of elements of the Book of Mormon, at least as it presents American history in a way very different from how historians or archaeologists present that history. So it's really and, cool and how you got this this connection direct link there. There's a more direct link there because the the what the so-called mystic symbol, which was a key 
published by Henrietta Merce in her book by the same title. It was a key, it was a cuneiform, uh, a, a cuneiform version of IHC or JHC, Jesus uh -huh. H. Christ, initials yeah. of Jesus written in a cuneiform code in the Michigan materials. It also comes up in the Burroughs Cave materials. So in other words, wh yeah, what are the sources for the, the Burroughs Cave materials? Everything under the sun. It's literally everything but the kitchen sink. You can find something in mainstream or fringe Egyptology, mainstream or fringe Assyriology, you know, whatever you find. You find some textbook that publishes this stuff, and somebody has probably scratched it on a piece of mudstone. Wow, these look awful, by the way. I found some pictures of the stones. Okay, let's go to break real quick, and when we come back, since we don't have an actual physical location, how... Let's talk about how we know that the Burroughs Cave is supposed to even exist. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We saw the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hey everyone, and we are back and we are still talking with Joe Wilson about Burroughs Cave. And before we get any deeper into this, I, I mentioned this over the break and I'd, I'd like to uh, reiterate it because it makes me sound smart. Um, the Burroughs Cave, as surprising as it is, like I've never heard about it and that just floors me that I've never heard about it. But it it's a very typical um, fraud story. Like Ken and I have gone over a million times you know, it has multiple origin stories. Nobody knows where it is. The names of the people associated. There's no way to verify that they actually are associated. And we're going to talk about the artifacts that are apparently associated with the Burroughs Cave. But again, none of them are provenienced. None of them have been documented course, yeah. as they've been taken out. And, you know, this it's it's a very typical story, but it's just kind of cool as hell. Yeah. Get out. And but, So what we should do right now, Sarah, is I want to put Joe on the spot. Are you ready, Joe? <laughs> okay. Uh, is, is I don't know. A, is there a cave? <laughs> no. There's no cave. <laughs> well, no, well, there you go. So there's not I even a physical answer. location. There's, there's no cave. We um, can end there's... the show right now. <laughs> <laughs> there's no cave. Uh, there are There are people who want to believe. I, I want to believe. There's a lot of people who want to believe. But there is no cave. The only there's a photograph of Rush, Russ Barrow, Russ Burrow's half buried, allegedly sticking out of the cave entrance. But it's clearly a rock shelter. It's not oh a cave. God. Clearly he's a rock shelter. He's wedged his body inside of a rock shelter. Um, that's that's the only one. Um, the story about how the cave was discovered, as you say, you said multiple versions. Was he was either metal detecting one day. Oh, by the way, he's always an admitted pot hunter and looter. Well, okay, right? well that just put him on my hit list. Civil war graves and stuff. And but he so he's out with his metal detector and his shovel looking for loot, and he falls through a trap door into a, down a down a long uh, like column. Uh, he's scared, freaked out by uh, the snakes, etc. He walks around with his flashlight. He finds so he's, he's just repeating guy. an Indiana Jones episode. It's, it's it's Indiana like, Jones it was, and Alice in Wonderland. And Alice in Wonderland. Yes, it was indeed. <laughs> first publicized in the wake of the success of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, no. If there's any similarities to the story. Oh, um, no. But there's other versions of it. There's another one where he was trying to illegally remove petroglyphs <laughs> on land that wasn't his. So in all of these stories, he admits that he's breaking the law? Right. Well, you know, the laws weren't written then, right? The late 80s is when you had the... Uh, the major, the laws with more teeth. Right. That, that, uh, protect, uh, protect, uh, right. our cultural heritage were not written until like 89, 90. Fair but, enough. So this was in the early 80s. So technically, I guess maybe he wasn't breaking the law yet. <laughs> yes. Uh, that stage. But he was, he's sitting there with his rock hammer trying to remove old Kickapoo, uh, petroglyphs when uh. he, when the wall collapses and then there's a stairway down. <laughs> into the dungeon, like you know, like torch, 
torch smoke all over the the roof where you know ancient roman funeral processions were run but all this happened and then he used his military training to to camouflage the entrance and then he ended up getting afraid when they were passing these laws he didn't want anyone to think he was you know desecrating graves so that then according to him he dynamited the entrance and basically collapsed it with all of the gold still inside it is full of gold if you believe him and uncut diamonds and bronze and copper armor and you know where did lots they get of human sacrifice where, victims and, where did they get the diamonds i don't know <laughs> that's not a normal thing but it's part, it's one of those things that you see in movie sets and these old you know in these, in these and if it's, if it's an uncut okay I'm, I'm i'm being too logical if it's an uncut diamond how did he know it was a diamond most people I, won't I recognize all, those I, we shouldn't get too much into <laughs> no i know i know i know i'm sorry there's, there's a lot of hearsay here i mean these are things these are claims that have been published but they're very Relatively few of them are published by Russ Burroughs, but Fair they're enough. all, you know, people who Burroughs has spun yarns to who then relate the yarns. Gotcha. Burroughs has published books himself, like The Mystery Cave of Many Faces and others, oh. other works. So he, Burroughs, does fancy himself as a, as a bit of a pseudo archaeologist too. So he's not just selling the artifacts, he's selling his own the memoirs and testimonials. Yeah. Um, about how they were in, they were discovered, um, and the, and 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 to different audiences, he shrewdly tries to peddle it to whoever will listen for whatever reason. So when he speaks to par paranormalists, he talks about the ghosts that he encountered when he was down there and the conversations he had with them in <laughs> English. Gotcha. Um, with you know, <laughs> uh, and various <laughs> other things. So it is it is extremely uh, multifarious this this scene and so the question is why is it significant it seems so ridiculous that you could just dismiss it and pretend like it it doesn't even matter at all and and that's what most professionals have done for decades right and that's sure. led to where we are now when the history channel can include it in their programming credulously right uh, as though there was a uh cause doubt as though they're teaching the controversy right uh, they're, they're, admittedly, they're not saying, oh, we believe this is true, but they're not saying that there is reason to doubt <laughs> it's true. You know, right. I, I noticed when they did it on America on Earth, they were deliberate to use low camera angles and soft focus when showing the actual artifacts because they didn't, didn't want their, they didn't want their cartoonish features to, you know, right. cause people to, to, to doubt their, you know, the, 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 the authenticity of the materials. Well, and we've so, talked about, we talk about that all the time, about how the, the TV shows and the movie channels like that purposefully mislead their audiences just for the sake of being eyeballs on the screen. So. Well, sure. That's yeah. right. It's for ratings. Yeah. It's for ratings. So, and it so is a high, and, and it's a highly rated show on H2. And, you know, and this is, this is the way it's going these days. Yeah. So, Joe, so in, What's the period during which, how, as best we can determine, those thousands of artifacts were actually extracted from the caves? Okay, they were, well, they're made out of various materials. Some, some of them, by the way, they disproved one of them on the American, on the America on Earth show. Scott uh, Woder debunked, he, Scott Woder believes in these artifacts, by the way, the host of the show. He is. I don't a, think a, he's a, ever met an artifact he didn't believe in, honestly. But, With maybe uh, a hand, uh, maybe an exception. But the artifact that he actually examined with his first, with his own eyes, which is a famous picture of a, a portrait of a pharaoh in marble, right. he was forced to realize that that was a fake when he realized it was a piece of a gravestone. Huh? It was a whole, it was a, whole, <laughs> it was a, it was a, a chunk of a colonial era, uh, uh, gravestone that somebody had then carved the, the Egyptian portrait into. And he realized this when he, he found a, a scrap of the, you know, born 18 whatever on the back oh and, wow uh, you know the, just... the, 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 the there was a there was a couple of letters from the gravestone that remained on there which is kind wow. of keep, right, that. that's just lazy so, <laughs> but, yeah, that's, but, that's you a know, lazy when there are these many, it is. They, you know what they can say they say and and, and nobody trusts burrows including the people who believe him so they can always say that oh he faked that one but the others well of course you know, well, yeah because, because he was not smart enough to come up with all this, these ancient languages, which I like how that's, some people can read. I like so how that's usually an, an excuse. In the the okay. whole the whole claim of so and so is not smart enough to do something. I I've encountered that 
argument a lot, and most recently with the Dare Stones, the the guy who is obviously the one doing the the forgeries. They're like, oh no, he couldn't do it. He wasn't smart enough. And it's like, hmm, you can play well, dumb. He wasn't smart enough to tell the difference between the front end and the back end of the Venetian ships he was he was carving. Ah. Because he has steering oars at both ends of the ship. Ah. Which is, you know, an impossible uh, design for a Venetian mm-hmm. ship. That's fine. Um, so yeah, he is, it is true that he was not smart enough to do it effectively enough to, to fool a, um, to fool a professional, but he is definitely not, you know, not an, an he's un, he's educated enough to, and, and he's a skilled enough artist to make some pretty impressive sketches on stone. Because the, the other argument this is the same one that's applied in the Michigan relics is that, oh my goodness, but there are so many of them. Nobody could or would go to all of that trouble. That, uh, makes, yes. that argument makes no sense at all, but you hear it. Oh, come on. There are thousands of these things. How could this one man or even a couple make so many? And you well, say there are 3,000, 4,000? The, and the, and the answer is quite simple. They didn't happen all at once. They have been leaked out over decades, meaning that if your career is manufacturing these things, then eventually, and, and many of them are little trinkets. There are some pretty spectacular ones, some that are even, I would say, cool, right? And it begrudges me to say that, but there are a few that, <laughs> I, you know, wow, this there's some work went into this. So there are a uh-huh. few of the bigger, flashier pieces were probably required some time to produce. But many of them are extremely simple. And, you know, and I know how to use a, you know, a chisel. I, I've taken stone carving 101 when I was a, you know, a, a sophomore in, in college before I figured out what I was going to major in. <laughs> and I would be able to, I would be able to make these things, you know, five or six of the, the smaller ones. I could probably turn them out in, in a few days, two or three days. Uh, so if you're doing right. this, if this is your main source of income for a long time, yeah, it's not unreasonable to, to imagine that your basement workshop is going to be turning out thousands of these over the long haul because they're not it's not like he just woke up one morning and showed the whole the whole group, collection group 3, right. oh, gotcha gotcha right but, but you know listen if, if russell bar if russell bar listens to this he might offer you a job joe five or six <laughs> of these in a, in a yeah. couple of days that, that's pretty good we can hire this guy yeah but but what? it is but the, the, the i think we should take seriously enough to show it to our students and to talk right. about the details how we know I mean, even though it seems so ridiculous that professionals don't even bother with it. But I, mm. but my point in the article is that no, we have to look. We have to be able to tell our students what's wrong with these drawings exactly, and that requires that you say, okay, this this is supposed to be a two banked warship, but it only has one bank of oars. The other one <laughs> is just missing because the artist was too lazy to draw it. Uh, this, you know, or you you can talk about a, a deep hauled ship like this wouldn't be impossible to navigate up the Mississippi River. The current is too strong and the river is not deep enough in the, in all the places that would be required to right. get this ship, this Phoenician galley or whatever it is, uh, up the Embarrass. Uh, there's a many, there's many similar arguments that need to be made for, for people to understand what's wrong with this when they see it. Sure. Well, this is, this is the theme of this show. And again and again, we talk about this when professionals, when archaeologists, ignore these claims simply because, well, they're so absurd, we leave this vacuum. Mm-hmm. And where there's a vacuum, there's something going to run it, is going to fill that in. And the assumption is that we're not responding either because we cannot respond or because we know the truth and we just don't want to, we don't want to admit okay. that, that our, our culture histories are all wrong because it's, we're ignoring a very important part of it. But, but again, so, so what you, what we're saying is, are these, are new ones still turning up? Can we even um, tell? I, I don't know. I think that I, he is, Burroughs himself has kind of gone on the down low. I, I believe he is still with us. He's still, I, I haven't heard any news of his passing, but I have not seen him. He's, he may, I, he may not be in great health. And I okay. believe he lives out west somewhere. So, um, and I don't wish him ill by any means. Um, no matter what I may think of his, his career choices but i'm i'm just n- noting that i think that his productivity has been in decline but there are plenty of other proponents who are making 
who, who really believe it. And so the question is, are there other men, others who are engaged in the manufacture of the objects? I don't know for sure. Right. I know I'm, pre- I'm fairly sure that some of the proponents don't actually believe them. I think that there have been some people who, who, who are in on the con, to, so to speak, who have, who have played along despite the fact that they probably know in their heart of hearts that what they're doing is a, a scheme. Right. right. Yeah. Sure. But I don't know for sure if beyond that there are, he had collaborators who were actually carving stuff mm-hmm. because Again, the style on stylistic grounds, there's very relatively few artists, despite the fact that there's so many different eons represented, right? I found right. you can see stuff that was copied from the Mesolithic Danube and stuff that was oh, that was copied right. from the from the gargoyles at Notre Dame and you know, and the Book of Kells. So <laughs> these kinds of you know what I mean? So we're talking like 7,000 years of, of cultural motifs uh-huh. that have been absorbed into one set series of lantern jawed profiles. These uh, many, right. many portrait carvings in low relief, uh, with, with details from all these different eras. Mm-hmm. And so if there was another person producing the material, you might expect some new, some different themes to emerge. And I haven't well, really seen any. Certainly sounds like Illinois was a, a, a hotbed of, of migration and colonization for a very long period of time. Uh, and it was a, a, a must, a must see destination for you know, Europeans and Phoenicians and Egyptians and all manner of old world people. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. So can you describe, cause we've, we've talked around it, uh, but we haven't actually come out and described any of it yet. Can you describe some or the majority of the artifacts or the artifact type that's being found in like better in really good detail for our audience who may or may not be familiar with the field of archaeology or even the fact that Burroughs Cave exists. Okay, I'm sorry. Which artifacts are you asking about specifically? Um, maybe the more popular ones because I, I I did a quick Google search and I'm I'm seeing things like. The, the 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 mud brick or the mudstone that you were talking about and there's also this head that keeps popping up oh I don't know which one it could be I mean there's so many different fanciful creatures a lot of things that come out of like again Egyptian mythology and I and and one specialist cannot be well versed enough in all of the material to talk credibly about it so right. I've stuck to the things that I've been able to identify. I know for some of the material has been copied straight out of standard Egyptology sources. Some of the material has been copied out of basically just pop culture. One thing I noticed, for example, in the in the in the Jesus stones or the Judeo Christian stones, is there's a figure of, of a European Jewish male that looks a little bit like Jean Luc Picard, <laughs> uh, wearing a modern yarmulke, a modern Ashkenazi Jewish head cover. Uh, the gotcha. menorah and a star of David. All um, <laughs> the particular design of that skull cap he's wearing is modern. It's not an ancient turban-like sure. headdress that would have happened from the period of apocalyptic Judaism when the migrations allegedly took mm-hmm. place. Right. Likewise, the star, the star of David. The star of David was uh, an ancient Kabbalistic amulet. It was a, a common architectural decoration in the ancient world. But it wasn't associated with Judaism per se until uh, the post-medieval period. It right. was associated with specific Jewish family crests. And then in like early modern Vienna, it started being used as a shorthand by Gentile synagogue architects to talk about Jewish neighborhoods. And then Hitler appropriated it for the, you know, in the final solution is as a as a, a mark for genocide. And then the state of Israel reappropriated it after World War II and became mm-hmm. and it became associated in the modern consciousness with Judaism. Got it. The, I, the notion that you would see the Star of David on a 2,000-year-old rock that's as a way of saying, look, this guy is Jewish, right. is it's really, really kind of comical in its ineptitude with right. when it comes to the putting the right, the, the anachronism of the symbol, of the symbol. Yeah. There's that's, a lot of anachronistic symbols in yeah, these. That's an, that is that's another commonality with other hoax archaeological artifacts. And certainly, when we talked about the newer Coley stones, 
the form of Hebrew that was seen on the first one, on the one that looks like a plumb bob. And that was the one where even even in the 19th century, people said, well, wait a minute, that's the kind of Hebrew that was only developed, that kind of writing in the 19th century, like a hundreds before it was 18th century, before this was found. And the same thing is true in the Davenport tablets, where at some point there's an ampersand and it's supposed to be on this, a tablet that's over 2,000 or 3,000 years right. old, but the ampersand wasn't developed, wasn't used, wasn't wasn't invented until long after that. So when you've got people who don't know exactly what they're doing, producing archaeological frauds, these kinds of problems do crop up, and it's not surprising and, and interesting that it would crop up here. Well, or, or, so, the, or the mystic symbol, the mystic symbol from the Michigan relics, which uh -huh. is a cuneiform, it's a cuneiform grouping. And this is, I wasn't the first person to notice this. If you read my article, you can get the citation. It's a cuneiform grouping on stone. Do you know how cuneiform is made? You take a stylus and you press it right. into soft clay. Right. But this person is carving the cuneiform. stylus part into a piece of stone, which is like, right. as I say in my article, it's like hiring a calligrapher and saying, can you do Times New Roman? You know, can you, <laughs> right. can you imitate it? Can you imitate a typeface for me? Because, you know, it's it's ridiculous that you would make cuneiform groupings on anything other than clay. But, but hey, it looks old, so. Now, let's go to break real quick. And when we come back, I'd like to talk more about the gold hoard that supposedly exists inside <laughs> our non-existent cave. <laughs> Archaeotech Podcast, hosted by Chris Webby Webster and Chris Boone Sims, is a show dedicated to the technology of the modern archaeologist. On the Archaeotech Podcast, we interview people using interesting tech, and we dig into the issues, advantages, and try to uncover the disadvantages of the digital age and going paperless. We all know there is no paper in the future, or should we say, paper has no future. Check out the show at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash archaeotech. Let's get back to the show. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently-used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. And we are back and we are still talking with Joe Wilson about the Burroughs Cave that doesn't exist. So one of these other things that I was curious if it existed was old artifacts from the Burroughs Cave. Much of it had been photographed. For many years, it would appear in these glossy, glossy print media as though it was the actual gold being photographed. Okay. Um, and then it was some of the stuff that was go was photographed was being kept in a safe deposit box, and some <laughs> of our people got to go and look in the box and see, oh yeah, there it is. Were, were any of these people living, or did they get to see the gold after they were uh, dead? Well, I believe some of them may have passed away, but they were testifying to this while they were still ah, okay. with us. But then what happened is the actual pieces became came to be possessed by folks who realized that they were not actually gold, but lead that was spray painted gold. <laughs> Um, did, so lead cast, did, and by the way, very kind of crude, crude cast lead amulets and things like that, and bars with symbols and pictures on them, not stamped, not like minted coins, right? Huh, One sided right. cast lead that's then spray painted. Was it only so, spray painted on one side? No, I think it's spray painted on both sides, but you know, that it's not too hard to, <laughs> if you're actually holding that in your hand to determine it is what it is. The Goodwill some the goodwill came across a bunch of them from an estate and they weren't legally allowed to sell them ah because, that would have uh, been awesome uh, best goodwill find ever because they were toxic 
because of the lead. <laughs> yeah. And that, so I think that they made it back. They made it back into a, a loving and caring hands. But wonderful. that's another story for another day. But so, the, um, did the Phoenicians bring spray paint with them when they were yeah, coming to the new world? Is I didn't know they happened? invented spray paint. I, I don't know. But the vast majority of the gold, it is alleged, is still underground. And the other thing that you see in some of the publications is grainy geophysical printouts from geophysics machines, you know, like a, a, a ground penetrating radar. OK, right. Uh, so they'll say, look, look, see this big zigzag line here? That's where there's some very large metallic thing that's buried here. So, you know, there's a there's an industry of treasure hunters who are looking for the lost gold of Burroughs Cave, which is allegedly still still buried in the wild woods of southern Illinois. And and it's not just the gold. It's enormous. Basically, everything that was spectacularly valuable, he left. What did he bring out? He brought out little rocks with pictures on. Mm-hmm. He left all of the suits of armor, the scrolls, the, you know, all the pauldrons, really impressive stuff, all of the stuff that like is the set of the Indiana Jones movie. That's the stuff he chose to dynamite. Well, you problems. know, if he's if he's mimicking an Indiana Jones movie, though, that's it's usually what happens. It's all the good there. stuff gets left and you all you get is like a couple coins. He grabs one thing, he, he runs away, and everything collapses into a giant pile of debris. Right. But that you could never possibly ever dig through, ever again. Never, no. It would, and, and he only has it in his, in his memory, you know, <laughs> that he can then go back and publish. But okay, right. so I'm going to ask you another question, and I'll be sidetracking us again, but if we don't know where the cave is, how do we have geophysical readings of them? How did they get the GPR out there? to take readings to because they know vaguely where it is they don't know where the entrance is and ah. there are a lot of tour groups that will go around and wander through the woods and you right? know go backtracking this way and that way uh looking under rocks and trying to figure out where the cave entrance that was dynamited where and, precisely and no it one's is. ever drilled on top of this supposed location because why the other, well, the other thing is because the landowners have had enough. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, this, the, the, these people don't actually own this land. Gotcha. And so if you were, and now it's more it's than one set of landowners, because remember, there's more than one, there's more than one alleged cave site, <laughs> and I, and so depending on, and and I certainly am not personally familiar with the landowners, so I don't know. I'm not speaking from firsthand knowledge when I say, but the rumors are that the people became alienated by the well-meaning Indiana Jones wannabes mm-hmm. and decided to prohibit further exploration. And that may have happened more than once over the years. It's also a convenient story for preventing people from right. going and trying to investigate. Because to be honest, if you're selling the objects that you have in your possession, you're not really trying to encourage people to go and look for them. You're enc- encouraging them to invest in you. Purchase them, yeah. Yeah. So, now, Joe, so yeah. supposing a you're, supposing a person is a skeptical archaeologist but open-minded and, say, an expert in Phoenician art or Egyptian, and they say, well, you know what? I would like to investigate, personally investigate, personally examine the Burroughs Cave objects that fall under my purview, my specialty or expertise. Where would one find these objects? Are they in a museum? Are they all in private collections? Is anybody is anybody forthcoming with letting people look at this stuff? There are several prominent collectors and I'm that have spent a lot of money on these things, mostly right. private collectors. Some are associated with sympathetic research institutions like the Midwest Epigra- the Midwestern Epigraphic Society in Ohio. And by okay. the way, I have nothing but good things to say about these people. I am not trying to disparage them as human beings. Oh, sure. Right? The people who are associated with the Midwestern Epigraphic Society are friends of mine who have helped me with my work in the past. Uh-huh. And they have, uh, going back to the 80s, a friend of my family was a former editor of the journal. Was how I got involved in this in the first place. Sure. It was why I was exposed to it enough to, to ask these questions. So going back in the mid 2000s, I I gave a lecture on an unrelated topic and somebody showed me one of these and tried to get me interested. And that's where my first 
that's where my first exposure to it is. So sure. I don't want to encourage traffic to them as a way of demoralizing them or making light of the situation. They really believe that they have the most valuable objects in the sure. Western Hemisphere. Right. And so I, I, I recommend some sensitivity to that fact and not trying to uh, disabuse them of that notion in, in, in the most uncivilized way possible, how shall we say? Oh, but, yeah, sure, that's yes. fine. We're not, we're not casting dispersions here. We can yeah. believe that somebody's wrong without thinking they're stupid or evil. Without think, yes, and, exactly. and, I, and, I, and, I, and I try in my work to maintain a kind of a diplomatic tone. They, you might not have any luck, even if you were on good terms, because there is a genuine skepticism that about establishment scholars and their perspectives on these items. Like, they, right. if they believe that you've made up your mind already, they will probably refuse to grant you the permission. Sure. If they believe that you're all that you're just out to debunk the material, and that's so they're interested in like labs doing expensive dating things that they would never just give you for free, right? And so right. when they don't, you know, when they write to such and such a, a a laboratory to use some some very expensive technique to examine an object, and they get a no, thank you, we're, we're not, we don't do charity work then this could be interpreted as part of the conspiracy, right? Sure. There's a there's a, a de, an, an effort to deny, to deny the merit of this stuff, and it even goes so far as to preventing the testing from being on. But I'm, again, through my firsthand communications, I have talked to some real archaeologists who've gotten a hold of some of these materials and done some informal and more formal analysis on them. One, a contract archaeologist from West Virginia named Robert Pyle he didn't publish on it, but he wrote in some personal correspondence, some of his firsthand analysis. He found some evidence of modern tools when he looked closely at the carvings. Right. He found some evidence that modern tools had been used to cut the stones and shape the stones and make the carvings, which is, you know, go figure. That's exactly what you, <laughs> right. would, expect. Yeah, of exactly. Exactly what you would expect if you were to do that. But the fact is, is the vast majority of the material has never been looked at. And it's in the interests of those who are making money on it to keep it that way. Now, how and are they so, making money on it? Both through sales of artifacts and that and the, the amount of money that has been made by selling some of these things is not widely publicized, right? Wow. Yeah, but sure. basically, through very naive old folks who believe that they have extremely valuable objects in their hands, right? That mm -hmm. someone might be willing to pay more than it's worth. We'll put it that way. And how much more? I don't know. But then wow. also the industry of magazine sale, right? Uh -huh. the, industry of, the industry of of scholarship that surrounds it. The And, 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 and I again, I don't want to point to guilt by association here. Some of the areas of interest for these folks are maybe more more legitimate or deserving of, of critical inquiry. But and unfortunately, Burroughs Cave tarnishes everything it comes into contact with sure. so that it becomes very, very hard to take anything seriously that has ever been associated with Burroughs Cave, any any topic that you want to talk about. If it's come up in the context of Burroughs Cave, it becomes less credible. Right. And so my own interest in this is as somebody who's interested in some of the questions of pre-Columbian transoceanic contact. My dissertation deals with Alaska, at, well, the, the, the Bering Sea region in the last 3,000 years and the material culture of Alaska indicating some degree of connection of flow of material culture and gene flow between Northeast Asia and North America in recent millennia. So I think that some some questions that get lumped in at, uh, and called diffusionist are being unfortunately not taken seriously enough as a result of things like Rose Cave being out there. Sure, sure. Has anyone uh, you said there was uh, some of the, these artifacts are made of mudstone? Is that a common rock type in Southern Illinois? Are, are we? Are we pretty clear that the, that all of this stuff, the, at least the rock artifacts, come from local material? I I would hesitate to say that because I have not done firsthand analysis. Okay. Uh, that was my my calling it mudstone has been actually from propon the literature of the proponents because some of the serious enthusiasts have done committed have done committed considerable effort to doing provenance of the material to try uh -huh. and it was quarried before it was carved. It, no matter who you believe carved it, right? It. And yes, local sources, and it's not just one type of stone. 
mudstone is one of the common types and slate gotcha. some some folks have have suggested that some commercially um convert commercially available forms of stone that were like sold to stone carvers right, uh, right. forms of of like i forget is it lithographic slate or something slate that is used yeah. in various um but, but things that are easy to carve things that are easy to carve that have been acquired by various means i mean i mentioned the egyptian the so-called Egyptian stone, the, the portrait of, of Julius Caesar in Pharaoh's headdress or something like that. Okay. That was debunked by Scott Woder on America Unearthed. America Unearthed. That was marble, right? <laughs> yeah, there's that, marble, that was pretty funny. All, there's all manner of different materials that have been used in these. Again, yes, you're absolutely right. What's easy to carve? But I don't think he was particularly picky or in rejecting yeah. something based on its provenance. And I don't think he's a geologist either. So, right, yeah. The things we look at when we're looking for materials that originate from somewhere else is let's look at the lithology. Is this a rock type that is local to the area, or whoever brought it in did it come from a long distance away? A really good faker, a really good um, perpetrator of an archaeological fraud would know enough, if you're trying to prove that this came from Egypt, to get stone from Egypt to, in the modern world, bring it here, carve it, put it in the ground, and then allow somebody to analyze it and say, you know what, this stone, the, the raw material, actually comes from Egypt. Which wouldn't prove anything, but it would make for a much smarter fraud. Uh, yeah, and the and the best frauds do that. The best frauds will do things like, you know, remove a 200-year-old blank folio, uh, page from a manuscript folio, and then get period ink and then right, of course. imitate period right. calligraphy and then do a, a a map or whatever on on using all those steps and there have been some very very effective frauds that require a lot of work to debunk them the the work that the, the work <laughs> that these folks have done to prevent these from getting debunked is to partially to cultivate the ridiculous the ridiculous atmosphere surrounding them part of that has been embraced by sure. the perpetrators. Why? To drive away those of us who would care enough to investigate, who are who, who take it who take this kind of work seriously enough. Right. So, in other words, by cultivating an air of the ridiculous around some of this material, I think that they have actually helped their help keep it in the dark right. from professional peers. So you think it's a to. you yeah. think it's a purposeful obfuscation of what they believe to be true by creating the illusion that it's farcical. No, no, I'm not talking about the, the true believers here. Gotcha, I'm sorry, not talking my bad. about the people who passionately believe this. I'm talking about Russell Burroughs. Ah. I'm talking about the people who are manufacturing and, and creating... Who, who know these are fakes. Are, what's that? Who know these are fakes. Who know these are fakes, but they, by cultivating an air of the ridiculous around them, have actually prevented the kind of scrutiny that would be expected if they were if they did a better job if they tried harder to make these appear more genuine right and there would be a, a lot more interest among professionals and that would have potentially revealed the nefariousness of the whole situation a lot earlier so, so we've established that these things are not available generally speaking for professional analysis but supposing one of our listeners was really interested in seeing for themselves some examples of the Burroughs Cave artifacts. Are they on display in a public venue anywhere? I Again, I think it's, it's all through private networks. They're on display in photographs, in magazines. Right, of course. Right, right. That's the main way. And, and, mo and my work was mainly, although I have handled them through, you know, um, People, through, other people have given them to me to look at. I have never ha uh, taken one home with me, right? I've never had one in my possession right. for more than five minutes at a time. And mm -hmm. uh, most of my analysis, well, all of my my real analysis for the for this um, publication was of photographs. But there is enough material in the photographs for really oh. effective critique of no, the material I, based on the content. Yeah, I understand so, that. But we, we're ending up with a story in which, all right, there's this cave, <laughs> but we don't know if it exists. Or we don't know exactly if it does exist. We don't know exactly where it is. And it doesn't matter. And it's it, been destroyed anyway. It's been destroyed anyway. And there are these artifacts. But no, you can't look at them, but you can look at pictures of them. It, you can understand why so, I, I, it, it frustrates the now, entire I, mind. I, 
I'm not advocating this because because I'm above board. I don't I don't want to deceive anybody. But if someone wanted to go <laughs> go uh, into the scene right and be and uh, a supporter, then you would right. be able to potentially as as if as a proponent or as someone who who was the opposite of a skeptic, you might be able to acquire the material more easily uh, or to purchase if you're willing to pay. If you go right. and, and, and inquire among the people who probably own them and, and say, I have money and I want to buy, then I suspect that you would be able to get some that way. And I but would the, normally discourage people from buying artifacts yeah, on the open and or black market, but there's I, no reason to worry about that here. I, I, no, but there might be because some material, some genuine Native American material has been associated with this stuff gotcha. as a way of getting it covered. That's another possible reason to cultivate the ridiculousness around it. Because what? if you want to sell some, you have some some looted artifacts, and you say they're part of the Burroughs Cave assemblage, then anyone who would scrutinize you is all automatically dismissing it as as fakes. But I keep, going, not, keep going back and say, so does the Epigraphic Society have an annual meeting where... If, if somebody's giving a paper out the Burroughs Cave, that they would have some of these on display. Does that I don't happen? Know. I don't know if they have them on display or not. Now, the the, the real epigraphic society, no. I mean, the, the main the main I see. Right, mother of organization. They they don't they're not supporters of it. The Midwest Epigraphic Society they have quarterly meetings. Again, they are very nice folks. I am not encouraging anybody to right, take course. trouble there. They have quarterly meetings and they do occasionally give papers on this topic. I don't necessarily think that that means that they're going to have the objects there on display. Some of the members do have them in their possession, and you can think think of them as being custodians of their, you know, right. and, and well-meaning custodians of these who believe that for posterity they're holding on to like King Tut's tombs relics. Right? This is big deal for them. Right. So it's like challenging someone's religion if you tell if you say your life's commitment to this topic has been in vain. Not to so, mention the monetary investment they may have made. Exactly. Yes, yeah. yeah, and again, I'm not speculating. I I haven't dug because I partially it hurts my it wounds my soul to think about. I really do. I care about some of these people as human beings, and I wish that they, I wish that they could see the light. But as it is, I I mean them no ill will, and so right. yeah. I, part of me says that, and here's the other problem: any t- time something does get debunked and disproven, they just say, oh well, it's just that one that's fake. Of course, All these right. others are real. When right. We have this many of them, and it's happened again and again. Many, many, even Burroughs himself. Oh, yes, there is um, there is an article. Hold on, I will quote from <laughs> Burroughs writing about oh that one artifact that turned out to be fake. That was planted by some huckster in my stash of genuine artifacts. And again, another very typical dodge oh, for yeah, a fraud. Oh, so it's not my fraud. It's someone else trying to fraud me. Fra- trying to fraud me, and I was. I was sharp enough to catch it. You caught it, but I caught it too. I actually caught it before you did. Right. And, and right. I've and I've since removed it from the collection. So I mean, and that's the problem. So don't try and disprove it through any one artifact. If you get a single artifact through some means and then you definitively debunk that one artifact, there will you'll not see the end of it because they'll the just shift their focus to, to another one. Like one. Game of whack-a-mole. Yep. The right. game of whack-a-mole. Oh, of course, of course. The whole will pop up somewhere else. And it will be a different mole. And well, of course, when 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 one of the proponents is a, actively debunks one of the pieces, they are exemplifying their objectivity by saying, "Listen, <laughs> I'm not absolutely committed to these things. Look, I will even admit this one is fake. Right? You this see, I have, I have an open mind. I am a skeptic too. Yes, and that um, and that happens. And all of the major players have done that at some uh-huh. time." Some ways. There are very of few of the major players who haven't, or they'll they'll say that they have been modified. One of the one of the major players now is talking about tainted artifacts, and those are the ones that have allegedly been modified by a second set of hands as a way, you know, or a set, you know. So the the tainted artifact line would say that Russ Burroughs has a bunch of real artifacts, and then he monkeys with them because he thinks he can get more money for them if they have the mystic symbol on. Them. I like right. So he adds the mystic symbol to them. And so he takes what are genuine artifacts and puts <coughs> what appears to be a telltale sign of fraud, but it's only the it's only the anachronistic symbol that's that's fraudulent. The rest of the artifact is legit. I like that fun. it's that the guy who initially started all this is the guy being accused of making 
fake ish artifacts. <laughs> I I find that entertaining. Okay. Joe, thank you so much. This has been really fun and I'm yeah. I've learned a new thing today that I'm just ashamed that I did not know of beforehand. Yeah. Um, this is great, Joe. Very, very, very revealing. Yeah, and I think you've done some fantastic work, especially with the Ohio Society and, and making inroads with people there. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the, the important lesson for me, Joe, here is in how many of the tropes or cliches in this example of archaeological frauds are repeated over and over again. In all of these others, there are elements that keep repeating. And I think that, there, that you know there are these themes to archaeological frauds and Burroughs Cave is right up there on top with, uh, if you had a checklist of how many of these things are repeated, Burroughs Cave is pretty pretty close to the top of all of them. Yeah, you could yeah, definitely I win Archaeological Fraud Bingo with this one. <laughs> it's a thing for sure. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful, yeah. And depressing at the same time, but you know. Horribly that's... depressing because it's making money for History Channel as we speak. Uh, Video uh, sales and everything else. So We're not, we're not going to talk about History Channel right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm. I'm. I shouldn't. Yeah. No, you. You can totally bring it up. I'm just going to. You like. You can't hear my eyes rolling, even though they're rolling so hard. Joe, thank you very much for being on the show, and That's I hope you can great. come back maybe for another like yeah. a, a another episode. Absolutely. Another great. follow up on some other related area uh, to this whole fun thing. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. And we will, everybody, our listeners, we will have links to Joe's article. Maybe we can find some pictures of the really authentic looking. And yes. There were quotes around that. Uh, some of these things look like they were drawn by junior high school. They really do. I am sorry. And they look nothing like real Egyptian art, for example. But that's whatever. But, but thank you so much. This was an, an excellent podcast. And I think we've all learned a bunch from today's conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And I will come back anytime. Roundhouses and Romans, human evolution makes us smile. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed what you've heard. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Remember to rate and like us wherever you listen. Be sure to comment on this episode and share us with your friends. You can contact us with your questions, comments, or angry email at archiefantasies at gmail.com or leave a comment on the show page. Show notes and downloads can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash archiefantasies. You can also follow the blog at archiefantasies.com and follow us on Twitter at archiefantasies. Music was provided by Archeosuit Productions. This show is part of the Archaeology Podcast Network and is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle. Thanks again for listening. We don't do dinosaurs. See? Are you happy? Do you get it now? Do you get it? Honestly. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue.